While we sleep, the guardians of the night take to the streets, having said goodbye to those they love. Each other knowing they may never say these words again, they face the evil that we run from. They dedicate their lives to those that would hate them because they wear the badge. They wear the badge not for the glory or recognition, but for the passion to help others. This is the LEO First Podcast. We'll talk to the men and women in law enforcement, those that have retired, those that keep the prisons secure, and anyone who's impacted by law enforcement. We'll peel back the curtain and you'll get the real stories, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Every law enforcement officer has a story to tell. Get ready to hear from the men and women who put their lives on the line every day for their communities and their country. Welcome to the LEO First Podcast. Now, here's your host, Michael Laidler. Hey everybody, it's Michael Laidler, your host of the LEO First Podcast, and welcome to another amazing episode. I have a wonderful guest on. We actually met through a mutual connection. And as soon as I saw this person, Paul Butler's recommendation on her, I was like, you know what? I need to get her on. So I can tell you guys from what I've read about her and what I've started to see through her social media, I'm 100% certain that you're going to gain value. And you know, one of the things that we love to do on this show is bring people on that are like us meaning they're in law enforcement, been in law enforcement, aspire to be in law enforcement, whatever it is, is some kind of law enforcement related to show that we're all humans. I know a lot of times in this industry, we lose who we are as people. And sometimes people that are looking at us think we're just a uniform, but that's not true. And part of the LEO First podcast is to humanize the badge, humanize the uniform and highlight all the things that we do each and every day, because we're people. One day you're going to retire. One day you're just going to resign, whatever it might be. And when you do that, you have to know that whatever person you came in as, you're going to have to be that person when you leave. Now, obviously, you have some experience. You have a little bit more education, but you're still a person. That uniform shouldn't be the number one definition of who you are. And I can tell, once again, the person that's going to be on tonight, you're going to see that. You're going to hear her story. You're going to hear her experiences. And the cool part about it is that she's in the same realm that I'm in as far as wellness goes and bringing some of the things that's happened to her to light. You know why? To share experiences and to improve. Because a lot of us, what we don't realize is that we all have a very unique story. And with that story, we should be highlighting it. We should be bringing some of the things that's happened to us to light. Because when we hear other people's story, we become inspired because you're, we're like, you know what? I grew up that way. That happened to me on a call. The administrative lieutenant did that to me, whatever it might be. But when you hear it from someone else's voice besides Michael Laidler, you see it ain't just one person promoting it. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to bring on a person that's been through some things, a person that's been to multiple agencies, a person that's been on the other side of law enforcement in a sense of being in the trenches and being able to share some of the things she has done. So, I know I rambled a little bit more than I wanted to tonight, but I haven't done a podcast in a while, and I really wanted to get a lot off my chest early so I can leave it to the floor once she gets going. But tonight, our guest is Lindsay McCall Long. She is going to tell you her story, and you guys know, as we're always unscripted, I'm going to ask questions that pop up, but that's relatable. That's going to benefit us all. So, Lindsay, tell us about you. Well, first, I'd like to say thank you for having me on. Uh, I do appreciate uh, our mutual friend, Paul Butler. And um, I got a chance to check out your podcast. And I really like, you know, just the interviews that you do. And like you said, you kind of, you're bringing that that human aspect to law enforcement and what we do every day. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, as far as I go, well, um, <clears throat> again, I'm Lindsay McCall Long. I live in Phoenix, Arizona currently. And I actually retired from my last apartment at Tempe PD about three years ago. And I, you know, I kind of, I'm from all over the place. It's hard to say that I'm exactly from one place. I was born in the Bay Area in California. And 
both of my parents were in the music business. So when I tell people I grew up moving around a lot, they're like, oh, you know, are you a, you know, a military brat? And I was like, no, <laughs> yeah. not a military brat, music. And my parents went wherever the music was. So my dad, um, who passed away when I was, when I was 17, but he was the um, drummer and co-founder of a funk group called Confunction out of the Bay Area. And my mom started off working at Stax Records and um, with Isaac Hayes and artists like that back in Memphis. And that's actually where my parents met. And then the group went back to California and, you know, life goes on from there. Uh, my dad eventually stopped performing and my mom was a record executive. She actually worked for MC Hammer for a while and then she had her own marketing company. So, you know, I am a rock and roll baby, as she likes to say, <laughs> uh, me and my brother both. And I really, as much as I love music, it just wasn't something I felt like I wanted to go into as a career because I grew up in music. And as much as I liked music, I just wanted to keep that appreciation for it. So I liked being on the outside of it as much as I could. And um, I did most of my growing up, even though I lived in Maryland and DC for a while, and uh, we moved to Southern California at one point, I spent the majority of my time in Georgia, actually. So I lived in Georgia for about 14, almost 15 years. So I was there from the end of middle school until I got my first police job with Gwinnett County PD. And um, it's kind of like, it's about 20 miles Northeast of the city of Atlanta. And the funny thing is, I didn't start out to be a police officer. <laughs> so I get that question sometimes. They're like, you know, people are like, hey, did you want to be a police officer ever since you were little? And I'm like, no, actually I didn't. And they're like, well, how did you get here? I said, funny, you should ask. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do after high school. And then I was like, okay, maybe I'll go be a firefighter. So I started going around to the local fire departments and I talked to them just to see what kind of training I did because I had decided I was done with school. I didn't want to do that anymore. And firefighters seemed pretty fun. And then my dad, um, my dad was actually the victim of a home invasion. So he was shot and killed two mm -hmm. weeks after I graduated from high school. Right. And that just kind of like stopped me cold in my tracks because my other option after high school was to go into the military. I was junior um, ROTC Air Force and I had planned on going into the Air Force and that, you know, I just halted everything because my dad passed away. So it was like a six month period. I don't really remember what I was doing other than sleeping and sitting on the couch, sleeping and sitting on the couch. Yeah. And eventually, you know, my mother, she was obviously very supportive and she was there for me and my brother. But her thing is, hey, listen, you have a time limit on this type of grief because you can't just stop living. Right. Um be lucky you had your father for 17 years of your life and your brother had, you know, your father for 14 years. There are some kids who never even met their father, whether it was they just weren't in their lives or they died, you know, before they were born or when they were too little to remember. So that kind of put things in perspective. And I decided to go to college because that way the military made me feel like I was going to be too far away and I wasn't ready to grow up that fast. And it's just me, my mom and, and my younger brother. So it's just like, uh, these are my people and I can't go too far away. So I actually went to college at a small school down in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, it was called Armstrong Atlantic State University. But now I think they've been um, purchased by Georgia Southern. And so I was down there going to college. I majored in criminal justice, but not because I wanted to be a police officer. <laughs> it's because I don't like math classes and it had the least amount of math classes. Most of us okay? don't. But when I got into the major, I really enjoyed the um, professors that I had. I had some professors who were former Savannah PD. So mm -hmm. they're telling you real life stories. They're just not regurgitating information they read in a book. And they're talking about the people that they connected with when they were on the street. You know, it's always fun to hear like the chases and stuff like that or a fight or anything. But, you know, they're telling you how they connected with real people. And I ended up, um, re, uh, I transferred actually to Georgia State in Atlanta, and that's where I graduated from. But to graduate, I had to do an internship. So I'm like, I have no idea where I'm going to do this internship. And I'm like, I lived in Gwinnett County. I'll just do it at Gwinnett County. It's no big deal. It's a 10-week internship. And 
I, you know, I always tell people the first few weeks of this internship, I was like, this job is dumb. <laughs> Who wants to babysit grown people all day? Because that's what it felt like to me. I'm 23 years old. I live at home. How am I supposed to go out on the street and tell people that are older than me how to live their lives when my mother still pays most of my bills, <laughs> you know? And um, I did my internship. I graduated. I actually applied the month before I graduated from college and I got hired about five months later. And that's, you know, I'm, I'm going to jump in real quick, Lindsay. So, yeah. And, and this is, and I'm, I'm, I, it's interesting you say that about the internship because I had a guest on um, Bob Stewart a couple of mm -hmm. uh, podcast shows ago and he's he's either in the georgia area or the flow no, he's north florida he's north florida okay. so he's like the tallahassee area and mm -hmm. one of the things we talked about when it came to trying to improve law enforcement is requiring kind of like an internship like let people mm -hmm. kind of see what they're getting their sieves into because law enforcement is one of those industries that you literally hit the ground running and mm -hmm. if you get a chance to go let's say 10 weeks to the Gwinnett County PD with them. Right. You can actually experience it. So in 10 weeks, you'll kind of know if you like it versus oh. you go to the Academy for six months, you do an FTO program for three months and now you're on the mm -hmm. road and not, I mean, you're, you're invested nine months into it. So you're like, eh, I might see a bad call, but I don't want to quit right now. But Right, what, right. What, thing, what Bob was saying was maybe we should be like the ROTC. Maybe should, we should be like some of these corporate America type companies. Right. Where, we're requiring people to do some type of uniformed internship to kind of see what they're doing. So how do you think that experience, if you didn't have it, would have changed like your perspective? You know, I, you know, I, maybe I, I guess I thought of, I've never really been asked that question before, but I think in a way I kind of looked at it similar to what I was doing in ROTC because ROTC was my window into military life, right? Right. Even to the point of um, there was a, um, what was it? Oh, there was a leadership camp that you had to go to uh, if you wanted to become a cadet officer. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, wow, we got to stay at, um, we got to stay on a military base you know, we went to the mess hall, we did all the things Correct. and it was a little, a window into it. So that's why I figured, okay, this is, this is definitely something that I can do. And I think it would be really good to do that more often because we already have the, um, explorer programs for some of the high school students. And I think that even goes until you're about 20 or 21, right. um, with, the with the explorers. And so, um, I think it's great because you get to see it. You get to see it from every aspect, right? And um, you get to see the forensic side of it. They even have in the explorers, they even have um, like competitions that they do. And so wow. they, yeah, I mean, they'll do traffic stops. They will do, um, they will do traffic stops. They will do like crime scene collection. They do all this stuff. So it really gives you a window into um, what it is you're getting into. And I think that is different than you just kind of guessing at it or even thinking it's more like it is on TV, you know? And I know some people that are like that. They're like, this is not what I expected it to be like at all. And I was like, what'd you expect it to be? Because, you know, all the stuff we see on TV, it's they're running around, they're chasing people, they're getting into the, these high stress situations. And then they solve a crime in an hour and then nobody writes a report. You know what I mean? <laughs> Nobody's sitting in their car home. typing on the computer like this for, for Right, three exactly. Hours. You know, so I, I think that's good. And another thing that I think is good is when people do like um, ride alongs or if you can get in touch with the recruiting office at a police department or a sheriff's um, office to really sit down and ask that question, like ask any question. I tell I would tell people who rode with me, don't just ask me questions about the job. Also, ask me about home life. Like, how does this work with your friends? How does this work with your family? So I think the more information you can get, the better, whether it's through explorers, whether it's through ride-alongs or even an internship, the better, because then you can make, I, I would think a more educated um, decision because a lot of people, they just see the sexiness, so to speak, of 
policing, I agree. the uniform, the pursuits and stuff like that. And, you know, you get an awards for something that you did, but it's, it's a lot more than that. And it can be heavy. That's the part people don't see. They see what they think is fun, but they don't see all the heaviness that can be involved in what we do every day. Yeah. And I know I threw you off with that question. I know you were kind of, no, you're fine, but, but I was, no, I, no, no, it, you're fine. It, and I told you, that's like, when I hear certain things, like, I'm like, you know what? Because I knew I was going to forget about it. So I was like, you know what? Let me bring it up. And when Bob said it to me a couple of months ago, I was like thinking in my head, I was like, that is an amazing idea because like you said, people come out and like, they're like, this isn't what I, this is what, this isn't what the brochure said. This isn't mm -hmm. what my criminal justice teacher said. This isn't even mm -hmm. what the Academy said. But now you're out there past, or let's say even in FTO, I had another guest that came on. She said her first night on FTO, she saw a double homicide. First night. Oh, wow. like, literally, like, I was like, what? I mean, she still made, I think, 20, 25 years. But you're right. Yeah. I mean, without that level of exposure, you have people coming into the industry that's a very high stress coming from maybe just college or maybe coming from retail, the restaurant. And mm -hmm. there's there's no way to replicate that without being in the the moment. And even yep. I, I would say 10 weeks would be kind of perfect because that's usually a shorter academy or something like that, just to have a few ride alongs or some kind of exposure so you can consistently see it. And I think mm -hmm. for me, I think that would give people a better taste. So when they get into those stressful situations, they kind of already knew because to me, yep. a lot that comes with our mindset is preparation, Pre preparing. 100%. Yeah, for the bad times. And how are you going to do it if you don't know? Mm -hmm. Well, and I mean, I mean, 100 percent, that's that's definitely something I like to talk to people about is like mental muscle memory. You know, we you know, whether you play sports, military, first responder, you want to train like you're going to play if, you know, the stuff hits the fan one day. Right. And so it's the same for our mentality. But if we're constantly in that world of, well, this is what I signed up for. I should be able to take this. Well, then you're not going to see the job for everything that it can be. And you're not going to properly take care of yourself because even when you're struggling, you're going to downplay the struggle because you're going to tell yourself, well, I signed up for this. I knew I was going to see bad stuff, but it's like, if you don't know how to prepare yourself for those emotions and for your first night on the job, seeing a double homicide, you know, that's, that's a that's a big deal. And that's a lot to take on where you probably thought your first week you would ease into it and maybe get some traffic stops and get like the crazy paper calls as the rookie, but not a double homicide. I mean, that's that can definitely be a lot mentally um, for a brand new person who's like, oh, I thought we were not doing this just yet. <laughs> <laughs> this was not on the this was not on the FCO checklist. Like double right. homicide was they said, like you said, they said traffic stops, responding to right. a burglary call, like like do us a community service activity. They did not say double homicide. That was a phase yeah. three. That was a phase three with, you know, with, a, with, a, with an optional on it. Yeah. You know, and so um and you know, and I think we can bring a lot of ourselves to the job. Like going back to your original question of like, you know, me me telling you about myself. I mean, I love to talk to people. So going out on patrol and talking to different people every day, I love it. You know, my husband says all the time, I've never met a stranger. He's like, you can make friends with a brick wall. <laughs> so, you know, so that that was a fun aspect, you know, or, you know, I'm very social. I have a, a, a good like friend group and stuff. And, you know, it also gives you different things to talk about with people when you're out on calls. You know, I'm a huge music lover, as I said. I like talking to people about their hobbies. Like, you know, I knit, you know, or I tell people they're like, you knit? And I'm like, yeah, that's one of my hobbies. I love going to concerts and I like to travel. I like to have game nights with my friends. So as you're, you know, you're sitting there maybe with a victim or even a suspect sometimes, depending on what the situation is, waiting on a transport, you can get into these interesting conversations with people. And I think a lot of what working in patrol taught me is not judging a book by its cover. Because when you get in the conversations with people, you can be blown away 
by actually asking somebody the right question and getting a response from them. And your whole blink response to that person can be completely obliterated by listening to what this person's upbringing was, what their education is, what led them to you being in contact with them. Sometimes we can look our nose down at people, but it's like, man, you don't even know that they're, even though it seems like they're at a low point, it was a struggle to get there. You know, and so I don't think we give ourselves enough leeway when we're talking to people. You know, I said, I'll see officers on calls sometimes if somebody gets too close to them, they're going to give them like the straight arm. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. I, I understand personal safety. I understand, you know, officer safety, excuse me. And I get all that. But as human beings, we want to be validated and we want to be seen. And sometimes that means standing a little close. Sometimes that means hugging somebody. Sometimes that means looking somebody in the eye when you're talking to them and say, hey, I know you're having a bad day. And unfortunately, I know I have to take you to jail, but you're, this is a bad moment. This doesn't, you don't have to stay here. There are things you can do to be different tomorrow, you know, and just adding that little bit of encouragement to somebody because, you know, words are powerful. We hear that a lot, right? Just something little like that, you don't know how that can change somebody's life, whether they tell you or not, but maybe that person's never had somebody encourage them before or just, or just to see them, even if they're doing wrong, just to see them as a person who made a mistake or can't seem to get off the track of mistakes. And maybe they needed to somebody needed somebody to look at them and be like, you know what? I get it, but here are some other options, you know? And that's, I mean, and that, that's definitely something I learned during my career. Um, it wasn't in my younger years. It, it took it took some time and, and maturity to get to that part. And I'd be like, wow, like somebody's story can completely change your mood and completely change your perspective on situations like that or just whatever's going on in your life, period. Yeah, law enforcement taught me that early. I mean, I, most people know at this point, I started at 19. I was in the police mm. academy at 19 and I hit the streets like maybe a week after I turned 20. So okay. I was able to experience life, other people's lives a lot quicker. And it did teach me a lot. So for mm -hmm. you, and I know I interrupted you as you were going, um, you got us to the point to where you got through your internship and you were starting with the um, Gwinnett County P Police Department. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us about that and tell us how you went from there, then eventually went to Arizona and then Tempe. Um, yeah, I, I first I was at I moved from Georgia to Arizona mm -hmm. and I was working at a small department called Paradise Valley. And then Perfect. I tra transferred to Tempe PD. But so police academy was 20 weeks. And mm -hmm. I remember I got hired like right after my 24th birthday. Mm -hmm. And I remember when the background investigator called me, I looked at the phone and I was like, are you are you sure you called the right person? <laughs> and he's <laughs> like, yeah, I said, you you all want to hire me. Like you want to hire me. And he's like, do you want the job or not? And I was like, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a great birthday gift, right? My first full-time job. And I started police Academy probably within a week and a half of that phone call. And I feel like for the first half of Academy, I showed up almost every day. Like, what am I doing here? Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know that I belong here. And, um, but looking back, I really enjoyed Police Academy. And again, because of ROTC, I kind of had that they're going to get in your face mentality and I know why they're doing it kind of thing. Um, so, you know, some of the yelling that happened in Academy by the instructors didn't bother me as much as it bothered other people who weren't used to that. And I hit the street. And when I hit the street, I ended up working at our in one of our busiest, well, our busiest district at the time. Gwinnett County is the largest county in Georgia. And at the time they had five districts. I think they have six now, but I worked in our district one, which was our smallest district, but our busiest district. And I remember hearing some like veteran officers being like, oh, I would never work at that precinct kind of thing or they would want they would want to get out of that precinct yeah. and I'm like what am I getting myself into but when I look back at it I'm really glad that I got put there it was definitely trial by fire um you learned a lot quick and to the point where I had been on for about I'd say about two years and I had officers who were just up academy behind me thinking I'd been there much longer than I had just because of, you know, the calls that I knew how to handle 
And I had a little bit of a calmer disposition. I wasn't like the little puppy that was like, oh, this, oh, this, what's on the radio? I'm going to go here. You just kind of take your time. But that's because at the time I was going through training, there were a lot of veteran officers there. Mm -hmm. So I kind of learned, you know, how they learned. Now, that's good and bad. I learned to take things easy. I turned, I learned to look at things big picture wise, but I also learned their negative coping mechanisms also. Yeah. And so looking back, that's something I could pick up on, but I didn't at the time, you know, um, some things I started feeling early in my career, it was anxiety, but nobody was talking about anxiety. Nobody was talking about cumulative stress. You know, it was just kind of like, ah, get over it. Let's get back out there. And you, who were you going to cry to? Nobody wanted to talk about going to a therapist or anything like that. So, you know, I did what everybody else did. You had a long day. You might, you know, sit around and talk about it later. And then you hit the bar after shift, drink a little too much, get way, you know, uh, not enough sleep and come right back to work and do it all over again the next day. And, you know, and it wasn't always like that. But, you know, I just remember like, OK, well, this is how you deal. Right. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed my time at Gwinnett. I still have very close, like lifelong friends there. I mean, still to this day. And I worked in narcotics and vice for a short amount of time, but patrol is my heart. I really, really loved working in patrol. And uh, I decided to go back to patrol after my short stint in undercover. And um, I was like, this is where I, this is where I wanna be. You know, the people interaction. And things like you don't get that, you know, when you're an investigator, or even a detective, you don't get that sure. same interaction with people. So I really enjoyed that part. But I think something that changed for me right before I moved to Arizona is I had I had a corporal ask me one day, like, what did I like? And I said, excuse me. He says, what do you like? Because whenever I see you, I always hear you talking about what you hate. You hate this. You hate this person. You hate this procedure. You hate this policy. And I was like, wow, is that how people view me? Because I'm pretty goofy. I can make fun of myself pretty easy. I have thick skin. I can joke with you. I can do all that stuff. And I, you know, like I said, I, I love talking to people. And I was like, is this people are viewing me as like an angry person that just hates life? I must seem miserable. And so that really bothered me. And I had a similar conversation with a friend of mine about my attitude at work. And I'm like, I don't like that. But I didn't know where the attitude was coming from. Mm. And so I was like, all right, I, I'm going to have to do some things to kind of work on me because I knew I wanted to move. But I think part of my moving was because I was unhappy. And but then I told myself, too, you take you with you. So that's so you go to a new place, you go out to Arizona, but once the newness of that environment wears off, you'll go right back to being your same miserable, negative, unhappy self in a new place. Mm -hmm. So I started slowly taking steps to be more positive, you know, to be more cognizant of my language. <laughs> and I still moved. I was looking for something different. I was just at that point in my life and there was nothing wrong with Gwinnett County. I, I love the department. I still love it to this day. But I just needed something else for yeah, me. Different. Yep. Moved moved to Arizona. Started working for a really small department, Paradise Valley. Had like twenty eight people, top to bottom. And although I enjoyed myself, it just was way too slow from what I was used to. Mm -hmm. You know, at Gwinnett, you were you were barely getting lunch unless somebody ran and got something while you were on a call. You were not going out on the radio asking for lunch. Because dispatch would be like, um, we don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> we have calls waiting. You know, and um, so it was nice. And I met some really great officers there. And then I went to a conference. Um, it's called ABLE. It's Arizona Black Law Enforcement Employees. And so um, I went to this conference. And at the time, Arizona's Black population is pretty small. And when I, I remember walking into this conference center and I'm like, oh, this is where all the Black people are hiding. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because I yeah. had seen... Yeah, I hadn't seen that many black people since I'd been in Arizona and in law enforcement. I didn't even know there were that many of us in law enforcement in the state. Um, and I was like, OK, cool. So I met some really, really great officers that I'm still gr cool with today. Some of them have become mentors over the years. And I met uh, Jeff Glover. He's actually the director of DPS now 
out here, but he was a sergeant at Tempe at the time. I met him. We got to talking. We exchanged information. And he says, hey, if you're ever looking to leave your current department and you're interested in Tempe, let's have a conversation. So I molded over for a few months. We had that conversation and, you know, I got hired and um, I worked both north and south Tempe. Tempe is kind of like a um, it's not a wide city. It's kind of like long, kind of like a rectangle almost. And that's where Arizona State University is. So that's in the north part of the city. And then the south part is largely reg- residential. We have a mall down there and everything. So I've worked both sides of the city. And I worked patrol the whole time I was at the department, except for when I did like light duty, I had an injury, you know, so I did the lovely phone reports. Uh, When I came back after maternity leave, after having my first child, I got to work in detectives for a while. I worked out in property. So I was doing some of their smaller follow-up cases that I can do from the phone. And then um, when I was on light duty for another injury, well, actually the, the, um, my shooting, after um, I came back on light duty after my shooting, I did get to work in crime prevention. So I got to see a little bit of everything in, in the department. And Tempe is an interesting place because you can get into a lot of different stuff there, even though the city doesn't seem that big. But there's a little bit of everything because of the cities that border us. You know, we have Phoenix that border Tempe. You have Glendale. Chandler and Mesa. Yeah. You know, well, Glendale, that's west side. That's way west. Um, of of Tempe. But, you know, you do have these larger cities and there's a freeway that connects to Tempe. So that brings a lot of traffic through too. So, you know, it was, it was good. And I really enjoyed myself. I, I did make some, you know, some good connections with some people there in the city. And um, I don't know, it was different than Georgia though, because it was smaller and it was slower in some aspects. And even when people would complain sometimes about busy nights, I was like, this is cute compared to my first department. <laughs> like if this is busy, you would hate to see us on a chill night back in Gwinnett because Gwinnett, you know, at the precinct that I worked at stayed pretty popping. Um, but yeah, I mean, I got involved in some other like police organizations since I've I've been here in Arizona. Um, I love to volunteer. I just actually, me and my son over the weekend, we did shop with a cop uh, Saturday oh, and Sunday. In, in Tempe. Yeah. 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 Well, we were... Um, we were actually in Scottsdale, but we were with some officers from Tempe and some of the surrounding agencies from the Valley. And then we were in uh, Chandler, Arizona, uh, the following day. Fun and, fact, um, I, fun fact I was just in Tempe not too long ago. Um, obviously, I didn't know you back then or I would have probably stopped through and we would have did this in person. <laughs> um, yeah. But I went to a place called Daily Jam. It was like a breakfast type place. Yes. I guess yes. the downtown mm-hmm. food's really good. So I, I mm-hmm. have an idea how Tempe, I haven't, I, I was there long enough. I, I did, I haven't ran outside twice because I don't know how the weather was like, be, like was amazing. It wasn't in, in, in the right. summer. It was like a couple of, not too long ago, probably about a month, about a month ago to this point. Okay. And yeah. It was yeah. definitely, you're right. It, it's not a really big city, but it's not that small either. It's obviously it's not Phoenix, but right. It's right. Definitely. It's definitely a respectable size. The, the crazy thing, like the, the city of Phoenix is the is almost the same size as Gwinnett County itself. Mm-hmm. And that's just the city, you know, and it's funny. I found that out because when I was in um, undercover, I got sent to Meridian, Mississippi for a two week undercover school. Mm-hmm. And there were officers from all over the country there. Oddly enough, I meet two officers from Phoenix PD and we stayed in touch. And then when I came out here to visit my cousin, because that's who was living out originally and kept saying, hey, why don't you come out? Why don't you come out? When I came to visit my cousin, I linked up with those guys. One of the guys was trying to get on with the aviation unit. And I was right with him that day. And he's like, hey, they're about to go up. Do you want to go? And I was like, at first I was hesitant, but he talked me into it. And it was really neat because, I mean, we got to go on some calls up there. And, you know, I got to see a gorgeous like bird's eye view of the valley, which was, which was crazy, you know, and it went from, uh, it was went from like late afternoon to night. So I got to see that transition and Arizona is known for its beautiful sunsets. And I got to see that from the sky, which was absolutely amazing. Um, and I'm glad I, I got that opportunity uh, to, to do that for sure. So now we've, we've gotten up to, obviously that the view is always amazing. Now yes. we've went from Gwinnett County, Paradise, Tempe. So mm-hmm. obviously you didn't do 
a full 20 to 25. I'm guessing that's, I don't know how long Tempe is. So there's a transition in your life. There is some pivot point that Mm -hmm. something happened in law enforcement. It's never surprising when things happen because we, we go to every call is different. And sometimes it's, it's, it's very true. Like what you do Mm -hmm. on one day, you're probably not going to do it all the next day. Five years from that, you're probably not going to remember what you did those two days. So right. there was a transition that you had to make in your life. So how, how did that go? Like, how did you get to the transitional point to where you're like, okay, um, this is this is past the point of where I'm going to continue to be happy. So that to answer that question, I think that transformation started for me a year prior to when my shooting actually started. And I'll tell you what I mean. Well, let's say a little over a year. So I have two children. My daughter was born at the beginning of 2017. Okay. And I went back to work um, at the beginning of April, 2017. I'm at work, you know, just trying to figure out life with an infant and a toddler at home and trying to squeeze back into my uniform after having a baby and all that good stuff, right? And I remember being tired. I remember feeling a little listless, but just blaming it on not a lot of sleep. I'm breastfeeding a new baby, trying to come up with a new schedule with two young kids. At the time, my husband and I worked opposite days and hours, like completely. He's in retail, but we we didn't have any days off together. We were two ships passing in the night kind of thing, right? Yeah, that's rough. That's rough. It, right. And so, and you know, and couples do that sometimes, you know, who do shift work for child care purposes and stuff like that. And we were very lucky because my mom helped us with our son and then our daughter and then my mother-in-law moved out. And, you know, so we we're very lucky to have both of our moms out here to help with the kids. But still, we're the parents. We have to do the bulk of the work. And I couldn't put my finger on what was going on with me. And I just chalked it off as baby blues. Those first few weeks after a woman has um, a baby and your hormones are kind of out of whack, you're tired, you know, you're just trying to get back into a good rhythm. And also, you know, your body has changed a lot. So there's the body image thing that plays with your mind. But this went on for a lot longer than baby blues is supposed to last. Baby blues is only supposed to be a few weeks. This went on for months. And so Finally, you know, my, and I have a great support group, you know, my, my husband, my mom, and even my mother-in-law got involved and had conversations with each other about my behavior and what they, you know, they didn't deem as normal for me. So my, my brave husband (laughs) came to me and said, Hey baby, I love you, but something's not right. You know, it's not just me that has noticed this. Our moms have noticed some things. It's just you know, you're not as social. You're not doing the things you normally do. You don't, you know, you're short with me. You're kind of short with the kids. And, you know, we, we should probably go to the doctor. And we went back to the doctor. Um, I was diagnosed with postpartum depression and my doctor was great. I mean, they involved my husband and all of my aftercare, which I think is very important because sometimes, family will let the mom deal with that by herself. And it's not just her problem to deal with. It's Mm -hmm. everybody's problem that's in the house. Because if, if she told you she had a terminal illness, you would be there for her every, every step of the way. But, you know, I've spoken to many women who had to go that postpartum route by themselves, even with a significant other in the house. But that's everybody problem because of what postpartum does to us and how we can view ourselves, our kids, our connections, significant others and everything. And that can be dangerous. Right. And um, so great, you know, treatment plan. I was doing a lot of holistic, holistic stuff in the beginning, but as time went on, I think it was like a placebo effect for me and I started to dip again. And so eventually, even though I was fighting it, I did get put on medication for my postpartum depression. And if there's anybody who's listening, if there's any advice I can give you, don't fight it. Because like medication can be the difference between life and death. Um, if we have certain like physical ailments going on and we're prescribed a medication, we will take that. And we may even tell people that we take it for our heart, for our high blood pressure, um, diabetes or whatever. But when it comes to our brain, we want to hide that. And we don't want anybody to know because they're going to think certain things about us. And 
that was probably the best thing I could have done. Even my husband says that. He says, I definitely saw a significant change. And I just didn't want to rely on the medication. We do have to incorporate other resources, you know, like exercise, like better sleep, having a good support system. Eventually, I started seeing a therapist. And not because of work, because just mom stuff, wife stuff, life stuff, you know? People. Yeah, being a person. And yeah, just being a person. And, it, and work wasn't the main reason, but yeah, work kind of came into play uh, from time to time. Absolutely. And so- um, so I was already seeing a therapist and then I was just feeling good. Like I was in a good place mentally. My, me and my husband's communication was great. Um, it's still great. Um, you know, our moms and just extended family and friends. I was in a better place to admit when I needed help. I understand part of our personality is well, I help other people. That means I can help myself or I can fix myself, but that's not always the case. You know, we aren't put here to be solitary beings. We're put here to develop community and to have com companionship with one another. Mm -hmm. And the same way somebody calls 911 and they need, they look to us to help them with their problem, we should be doing the same thing because we're only human, right? Yeah. And <clears throat> so I got diagnosed in November of 2017. Life is chill. Life is cool. You know, I'm just trucking along. And I felt like I definitely had a change in like even my mentality at work. You know, I was wanting to get more involved in certain things. I was thinking about, you know, special units, maybe even getting promoted one day. You know, my kids are a little bit older. And then October 29th, 2018 ca happened that um, took me off the path I was on and put me on my current one. And really, and led me to us talking today is uh, basically what happened was my partner and I were going to serve an order of protection against a gentleman uh, over domestic violence that had occurred over the weekend against his girlfriend. And um, he wasn't hearing it. And he opened fire on us. And my partner got hit once. I got hit three times. And the way that transpired was there was an order of protection that was filled out earlier in the day. Another officer attempted to serve it twice and there was no answer at the door. But he the the suspect slash boyfriend was home because he had texted his girlfriend a couple of times saying, you know, that the police had come to the house. So now he knows she didn't go to work. He thought she went to work that day. Now he knows she went to the police. Yeah, so, no, so my partner. Up. Yeah, it's building up. Right. Now. Yeah, his right. anger. Mm -hmm. And so my partner had already met with the the girlfriend or the, or the victim, had done the police report. When we found out there was an order of protection, we we're like, OK, well, we'll try to serve it ourselves because she can let us in the house. If he's not going to open the door, we'll just have her let us in the house, which it's something we've done before. And so even from what I remember, even the text messages he was sending her, because I've been on calls like that before when the person who needed to be served was texting, texting, you know, the you, the plaintiff. So, you, you know, and I, I want people to understand that, like, like a lot of things like there's no script to that. Like, it's not mm -hmm. like there's a perfect way. And I, some people are like, well, why did I, and you, I'm sure you got the Monday morning quarterback, right. When it happened. But as you're telling it, I want people to understand when they're listening, say that, or I want people to understand that there's different ways to handle everything. Some things that we've mm -hmm. handled in a certain way, like you don't take the SWAT team every time you go to go handle right. something that might be a little gray. Like sometimes mm -hmm. it's just you and your partner. Sometimes it's just you. You really don't know. So on this particular day, and I'm gonna let you continue your story, but it's it. I mean, it's it was the way that it made the most sense at the time. It wasn't like someone had a book that said, "Hey, you know what? Just because you, <laughs> just because they, just because they try to serve it twice, the third time, this is gonna happen." No, there was no book. It could have been number right. five, number six, number seven. It could have been the first one. We really don't mm -hmm. know, but. That is a method. You, you're not the first person that's used somebody else, like use the other resident to open the house. So sorry, I just I was listening. Sometimes no I know people are going to be. I know you're people right. probably have been, and I want mm -hmm. people to understand that even if you're in law enforcement now, every method is different. Like you're you're going to handle things differently. Just, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean there's right or wrong. It's just every situation is different. If you knew exactly what you were doing, we wouldn't have an industry. But 
we go into the <laughs> unknown all the time. Like we go into yeah. like they say the shadows of hell to to handle mm-hmm. things that no one else like. I'm sure your husband being in retail, he ain't going to go do that. I, he He's not signed up to go tell someone that they have a protection order now against them. Like, mm-hmm. no, your, your, your non-law enforcement person doesn't want to do that and will not mm-hmm. do that. So mm-hmm. in this industry, you have to kind of understand that's the other side because there is an inherent danger behind doing any of it. Well, and even to that point was, it's funny because like I said, my husband's in retail. When we met, he was working loss prevention. To me, that was more dangerous than what I was doing because that was back when they could still physically stop people, you know, or, or even when they changed it to no longer physical, physically stopping somebody, even just verbally. I mean, he's had knives pulled on him. I've never had a knife pulled on me. You know what I mean? And, And I have a vest and all this stuff on my belt. So I'm like, sometimes I would tell him, I'm like, uh, just come home. You know, that is not our stuff. The store has insurance kind of thing, I, you know, and it's fine, but yeah, I mean, it's just, and, and going back to like the order of protection situation. Yeah, go ahead. And I do get those questions. You're right. You're 100% right. I do get those questions, but I also remind people, it depends on the information we have available also. Exactly. So when someone fills out of order of protection, you know, the officers or the deputies that have to go serve this, we're relying on the plaintiff to be as very truthful, don't embellish and stuff like that, but be truthful about what's going on. Because if there's a danger we need to know about, we don't live in your household. So, or we're we're not there 24 seven when you're getting the phone calls or the person is showing up or they put hands on you. So we need to know that. And the other thing is, you know, um, states don't always share information the way that as easily as they should. So this guy had a record in another state, but, you know, as we're doing our, you know, uh, criminal history check and all that stuff, some of that just wasn't coming up as quickly because, you know, we were there, like we needed the information now. And so, you know, and obviously if he was wanted, that would have come up immediately when we put his, um, you know? Yeah. So anyway, he, he has a history of violence um, and unfortunately, as far as the, the girlfriend slash victim, and I, I really pray that she has, um, gotten some help because she had been involved in other abusive relationships. This wasn't our first time dealing with her in, uh, in, yeah. in our city with a domestic violence situation. Right. So this guy had beat her sometime over the weekend. Like I said, he, she thought he went to, or he thought she had gone to work that morning and now the police are at his door. So as we're walking up to the house and like, um, uh, you know how, like on a body camera, especially, I don't know how all body cameras work, but the Axon body cameras, that first 30 seconds, there's video, but no audio. Well, I remember as the audio comes on, you can hear my partner asking her, are there any weapons in the house? And my partner had asked this question more than once. The girlfriend said no, but that doesn't mean there aren't weapons in the house. We don't live with these people. And I often joke, I live in Arizona. It's the Wild West. I assume <laughs> everybody, you might see a coyote running down the street with a gun on their hip. I know, live in Texas. Just, I know. I, I live in Texas. So you know I, what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it's real. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's Oh, having weapons are real in the state of Texas. So Arizona, yes. I, I, feel, I feel you yes. on that one. Okay, so we we were going up to the house and it's a small house with a carport. His car is parked in the carport. There's an exterior door in the carport and she goes up, she un, you know, she has standing, she has rights to the house cuz she lives there. She unlocks the exterior door that leads into a small laundry room. And as we're walking in, uh she she kind of opens up the door that leads from the laundry room into the house. And she doesn't go all the way into, into the house. We kind of walk past her, which I was like, well, why isn't, you know, that's interesting because a lot of times women want to see the man get put out, but that wasn't her thing that day. So that's fine. And then my partner starts taking her flashlight out with her left hand. And I'm thinking, why is she taking her flashlight out? Because at this time, um, it's it's close to three o'clock. So let's say like 10 minutes to three in the afternoon. Oh, so it's And bright. we worked. Yeah, exactly. It's bright because I, I tell people sometimes like our, I don't think even our brightest time of day is noon in Arizona. It, I, to me, it's between like one, like, uh, you know, it's between like two and three. Yeah. And um, 
So she's taking her flashlight out. And I was like, man, why is she doing that? So as I, my eyes are adjusting because I had sunglasses on. So as we're coming through the door, I'm taking my sunglasses off and my eyes are adjusting. It's dark in the house. And I was like, why is this so dark? And not necessarily that's unusual in Arizona because I have blackout curtains everywhere in my house, but it just the energy felt different in the house. Like it was eerily dark in the house. And it's just one of those things of where there were things happening too quickly for me to articulate them to my partner. And it was funny talking to her about it later. She felt those same things, but you know, things are moving, things are moving. Right. And she's kind of, she's standing in the kitchen area and I hear her talking to somebody. So I turn to my right and there's a male coming up a hallway that she can see down better than I can. So I step into the kitchen a little more and I turn my body so that I'm facing the male that's walking towards us. And now my partner is to my left. And, you know, she calmly says who we are and that we needed to talk to him. And he got within, I'd say like 12 to 15 feet of us. And she said something to the effect of, um, you know, asking him or telling him to take his hands out of his pockets. Now, up until this point, he said nothing to us. Like, body language was very neutral face was neutral right. like never spoke a word to us and when she made that statement or 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 you know asked the question he came right out of his right pocket with a six shot revolver and immediately started firing on us mm -hmm. and because my partner had her left hand up with the flashlight facing him the first bullet actually skimmed up her right bicep and came out the back of her shoulder um she's a little smaller than me I actually thought she got shot in the face initially, um, but I didn't have time to look because he fired again. And I actually was trying to step to the right and draw my firearm. And I got shot in my right forearm. I, and I there saw, was like, I saw your, I saw the scar. I was going to ask you about that. I saw the one on um, IG. Yeah. 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 And I, you know, I, I, I joke sometimes I tell people that my, my career is a forearm model. You know, <laughs> and, and I tell people that that's the humor that we have in law enforcement. Yes. Right. Yeah. But, right. but it's, it's, it's based on a very traumatic incident. But we, exactly. we got exactly. to we we make light of it. we have to. Exactly. And so but there was like this. I remember my arm, my hand, my hand and my arm. There was a stinging like a burning and then numbness. But and this is all happening right on top of each other. So right. he is rushing towards me and the girlfriend had already started running out of the door when the first shot was fired. Well, I turned and I ran too because he's rushing me because he's a bigger guy than me. And although I was I was a little heavier then than I am now, you know, I'm not going to be able to take a hit from a man. No, it's a you know, different power just, no matter what. Work. I mean, that's genetics. And now, you know, right. My, and my hand is out of commission. So I can't even, you know, if I'd gotten it out quick enough, I, you know, he could have been shot in the chest and dropped right at my feet, but this is not what happened. So I turned and I run out of the door. He fires again. I get hit in my upper left arm. That was a through and through that I didn't even feel at the time because of adrenaline. And um, my partner was, and I didn't, this is, I found this out later because remember, I thought she got, I thought she got hit more severely than she did. My partner did return fire. She, as he was running out of the door, she did, she fired once and she did strike him and it struck him in his upper torso area. He tried to shoot back at her. It went into the house. Um, according to her, he was like two steps behind me as I was going out of the house. Right. And um, he was able to shoot me a third time in the lower left part of my back. Uh, my vest did get it, uh, did, did um, protect me but it was the bottom part of my vest. And if you've ever opened up a vest, you have like the yellow Kevlar in there. They put what almost looks like masking tape at the bottom of it. Yeah. I got hit in the tape. So oh, yeah, I so took all of that energy. Yeah. Yeah. And people were like, oh yeah, but you know, if you get hit with a bulletproof vest, I said, uh, it's bulletproof. It's not pain proof. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, I've never been hit. But I, I tell people, hey, <laughs> If you want to know how it feels, that that's on you. But try, it's still gonna hurt. You're right. The pain is just like yeah. it's like paintballs. People are like, oh, paintball. Oh, paintball. There you hurts. go. Yeah. People are like, oh, it don't hurt. Oh, I said, oh, if the person, if you play with experienced paintball players, nothing like a bullet, but mm -hmm. it, it hurts because they 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 turn their guns. What up. about? I'm just like, why does this? Why do you have to get the strongest paintball? Can't we just get a? But soft wait. Gun? 
for those of us in law enforcement, simunitions. Simuni- yeah, there you Getting go. Simunitions, exactly like listen, that. Listen, yeah. oh, I hurt. have been hit with simunitions Ooh. in places of my body that I don't even want to tell you because we don't know each other that well. Ooh. But those yeah, hurt. Yeah. Yeah, they hurt. I mean, those, you know, so yes. And, you know, like a vest is made to kind of displace that, that, in, that, that energy, that impact. Well, because I got hit so low on the Kevlar, I yeah. took all that impact yeah. and it felt like I got kicked in my back by a horse, honestly. And that hurt worse than my arm. And because it was over my kidney, it knocked me off my feet. So I fell face first alongside of the driveway that we, we had run out to. Well, For whatever reason, and I'm glad it happened, he ran in the opposite direction. So he ran to the left. I fell to the right. And I'm glad because I had dropped my gun near where I had fallen because I just everything just all my feeling just went for a second. And he had one more bullet left in the revolver and he hopped over somebody's fence and used that last bullet to take his life. Um, I was obviously dazed and confused on the ground. Um. My partner says, and this was confirmed with my body cam video, that I went down and I popped back up. But it didn't feel like that to me. And even after I saw it on the body camera, I said, there's no way because it felt like I was down there for like a solid 30 to 40 seconds. And um, I remember thinking I was paralyzed because I couldn't feel my legs for a hot second. And then, you know, just the weird things that pop into your head. Like, did I just go to the bathroom on on myself popped into my head? Mm -hmm. Um, Because if and if I did, I can't feel it because I can't feel anything from the waist down. And then I'm wondering where he is because I don't want to get shot in the face. I don't want to look over my shoulder and there, you know, he's he's pointing my firearm at me. And, um, you know, then, you know, we were talking about mental muscle memory. You know, I started thinking about police academy just like rushed back into my brain my instructors from georgia were screaming at me about staying in the fight and you will go home and this is not where you die like i like still to this day and i some of those same instructors i talked to them after my shooting like i was like y'all were there with me like gwinnett county police department was there with me during that moment and um i was like and my 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 husband's face popped in my head and this is all in a matter of seconds. Like literally I fell and popped back up, but I I remember these things very distinctly happening. And my two kids were very young. My daughter was 22 months. My son was four. So I was yeah. like, well, this can't happen. And I, you know, I used some choice words with myself at that moment. And I said, bitch, get up. Cause this is not where we die. Um, he's going to have to work to kill me. You know, I don't care if it happens down the way, but there's going to be evidence, or as my mother liked to say, detritus strewn about, because this is not going to happen right here. And I was able to jump up. I was able to get behind cover. But as I'm going to cover, it was a a tree a few houses down. You know, I'm trying to grab my radio that's now swinging. You know, you get in a fight and your mic comes off. And And everything's everywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Everything is twisted. So I'm trying to find it. And when I bring my hand up, now I see all the blood on my hand and I, I, I turn my forearm over, which is broken. It broke my radius bone and my arm is like, like that. Yeah. And I've never broken a bone. And I was like, well, that's broken. <laughs> and yeah, I but that, yeah, that, that's not normal. Not at all. And I'm looking at both the holes in my arm and, you know, I had the auditory exclusion. I couldn't hear my partner asking where I was or where the suspect was because we had actually ran past her. So she was still in the house. She didn't want to pop out just yet, you know, just being safe because he could be on the other side of that wall for her to pop out. Yeah. You know? And so she, she's definitely a badass in my eyes. I don't care, you know, how humble she tries to be about it. I believe um, that she saved my life when she shot him. Mm -hmm. Um, I def, I definitely believe that. Um, and even watching her body camera, you know, she had the wherewithal to put her tourniquet on. Did Lindsay put her tourniquet on? No, <laughs> I had forgotten it and had a tourniquet in my pocket. Okay. <laughs> I am just like, my brain is trying to, my brain and my mind are trying to get on the same page. My brain is in full blown survival mode. And my brain is, and my, my mind, excuse me, is like, right before she called me to come assist on this call, I was trying to get something to eat. How, what happened? I just wanted a teriyaki bowl. Like what yeah. happened? You know, Usually how and, it goes. Um, yeah, you know, and so again, 
I, I couldn't hear really anything on the radio. I did get out on the radio at one point. Don't ask me what I said because I don't remember. I've heard the radio traffic, but I was like, who is that high pitched person on the radio? Because <laughs> I don't have a very high voice, yeah. but they were like, somebody later was like, oh, that's you. I said, oh, no, that's not me. That's not how I speak. Even when I'm stressed, that's not how I speak. That's not, <laughs> so, me. That's not me. All right. And um, I was like, I have to go find my partner because she probably ran after him. And training kicked in again. I threw my my injured arm across my, my chest. I reached across with my support hand to grab my firearm. No firearm in my holster. And I was like, that's a problem because he has a gun. I know I have two shot arms. What am I supposed to do? Yeah. And I thought I dropped it in the house initially. And I kind of did this dance back and forth on, do I go back in the house or not? Do I go back in the house or not? Yeah. And I was like, what am I going to do if, if I encounter this guy? I didn't carry a backup firearm. And, um, the thing that broke me out of that back and forth was I can hear sirens coming. And from the time my partner put out her radio traffic to where I can hear the sirens on my, my body camera, which had fallen off of me, it's, it's roughly 90 seconds, which is fast, Yeah, but it's largely due to the time of day and the day of the week and the location because we're we were double squad day for the the early shift that day so this is right before they get off a shift so they're finishing up calls they're right. headed back into the station we're down the street from one of our substations where yeah. people take breaks some of our um special units are housed and also we were right off of a main thoroughfare that's heavily patrolled and the first officer that actually got to the scene had been sitting right at the corner at the 7-eleven mm -hmm. and it was weird because I remember seeing that officer and thinking, I have to get him to understand what I'm feeling right now. And I just looked at him and I was like, he took out a gun and he shot me. That's all I kept saying to him. And he's trying to check me, but I, I need to make it feel real. So I keep looking at him in his eye, even though he's trying to check me and spin me around. Like if you've ever tried to have your kid put on a coat and they keep giving you the wrong arm. Yes, that's how I felt. Yeah. And he finally just grabbed me by the shoulders and said, Lindsay, you're going to be OK. I need to check you. You're safe. You're going to be OK. And so that's when, you know, another officer showed up. They start checking my arms again. That's when I saw that I was shot here. I looked down. I saw two holes. I was like, well, that's a problem. Um, I just I knew I had a gaping hole in my back because of the pain, but it was just really bruised. It broke the skin just slightly, just because yeah. of the impact, not the bullet, just the impact. But I mean, I was black and blue for weeks in that part of my back. And, you know, shock and uh, I guess high stress will do a lot of things to your brain because I just got off the phone with my mom on the way to that call. And one of the first things I said as the second officer arrived was, my mom's going to freak out. <laughs> my mom's going to freak out when she hears this yes, that's and good. finally you know exactly and I get thrown in the back of a patrol car and um excuse me I get thrown in the back of a patrol car and whisked off um to the um to the staging area and um I remember as we were going to the staging area because it was kind of like in a parking lot thinking, why are we going to go get Mexican food right now? <laughs> That's all I remember so thinking. Because... doesn't add up right now. That's Harry right, right here. Right, right. Hold on just a second. I'm, I need to grab something real quick. Um, my, uh, I don't want my computer to uh, die on you. <laughs> oh, no, that's realistic. No, hey, with, with video yeah, podcasts, no. yeah. Yeah, that's the last one well, you want is the power off. Well, you know what's funny? And this doesn't normally happen, but apparently, and I bet you my kids are responsible for this. My power strip that I have down here is no longer plugged in. Uh, so that's that's part of my problem. So let me plug this in real quick. No, you're good. No, I understand. And that's what people understand. Like, I, like we talked about in the green room is that <laughs> sometimes they, this is real stuff. I mean, technology, yeah. you don't have it plugged. I mean, I had a presentation last summer. And I, I I was going good. I was flowing. About forty five minutes into, I turn around uh -huh. my screen, and I was like, "That's a new one." So I went and touched touched my lap, my MacBook. I was like, "This is weird." And I looked down. I said, "Oh, I I didn't plug I I didn't plug it in." And I had to be straightforward. I said, "Hey guys, y'all gonna give me like thirty seconds to at least plug this back in." And they're like, "Oh no, I'm you're fine." 
but it's real. I've totally had that happen before. I've totally had that happen before. Yeah. yeah. So, so all right. I always we check should. the plugs like four or five times out when I speak. Like I know you start you start obsessing over it a uh-huh. little bit. Um, I'm like, is the power ship on? A- is is a, is a little lightning bolt on my computer? I check everything because I don't want it. I don't want it to happen again. All right, give me two seconds. Let me let me grab this for me. Oh no, you're good. I good. But I can I, like I was telling people. I mean, when, when we look at like when we're hearing your story and we're looking at different things that happen, I want people to understand that this is this is what happens. You go to different calls for service, and you never know what you're mm-hmm. walking into. You think you're just going for a teriyaki bowl after this, this five minute protection order. Next thing you know, you're in a shooting with a person that since he shot himself, obviously you will never know his true motive unless there's a a letter or something like that. But well, I, I, so what, what I was told later on, and I I also read through the report. um, It sounds like we most likely interrupted what was supposed to be a murder suicide. Oh, Okay. And so I, I, you know, I think he every bit expected her to come through that door and then that was going to be a wrap. And then, you know, looking back, like there was nothing in his eyes, you know, there, there was nothing there. Even as we were talking to him, it was just, it was devoid of any emotion. I think he had made that decision and that was the route he was taking. Um, but even that's and, a lot of assumptions. I mean, even that, I mean, I without, mean, true. Yeah. You true. know what I mean? At the end of the day, I tell people, I mean, it's, it's maybe, maybe he just wanted to be, um, suicide by cop. I mean, you really don't, I mean, at the end yeah. of the day, you really don't know. I mean, obviously he had to get a gun. Um, he, he yeah. obviously was thinking about killing somebody and probably killing himself. But like you mm-hmm, said, I mean, it could have mm-hmm. been killing just her. Or, I mean, he knew you guys were coming. I mean, at some point, I mean, well, it was your third time. I- I think it's ironic that, you know, here is someone who hates women enough to beat them. And then he doesn't get not one, but he gets two female officers, you know? So sometimes I think I was like, well, shoot, we probably triggered him walking in there. You know, he, he, he has a disdain for women to the point where he puts hands on them. Um, And now you got two females that are going to walk in your home and, you know, try to arrest you or tell you what to do. And, you know, so you're right. There's like, and I've thought about all those different reasons, but you know, then I'll drive myself crazy trying to oh, figure yeah. out why, because it was just, you know, the simple thing of he wasn't going for it. Um, Whatever it is. Yeah. You know, and my partner and I, we both get extracted from the scene. And I, I remember in the staging area feeling like I was about to pass out because of the pain, because now the adrenaline starting to wear off. And um, I felt like I was about, I was getting nauseous. I was sweating. I'm apologizing to my, uh, my shift partner who, whose car I'm bleeding in. And, um, but I didn't want to leave until I saw my partner. I knew that she was okay. And so once another car came into the parking lot, me and her locked eyes, I knew she was okay. She knew I was okay. Okay. Let's go to the hospital. And, um, there was a, a interview that I did recently where I mentioned fire and EMS because, you know, I love fire and EMS and I thank them tremendously for everything that they did for me and my partner that day. And I know it's got to be hard for you to be rushing to a scene only to get there and see it's an officer you've worked many, many calls with over the years. You know, you, you go from being a partner to being a patient. And I remember when the captain first, you know, and this is a seasoned guy when he first came around the corner and saw me sitting in the back of the SUV, like, I saw the look in his eye real quick of recognition. And then he just jumped into work mode, you know? And so I'm very grateful to them. And, you know, now we're in the ambulance and, you know, things are being pulled off of me left and right. And, um, but for some reason, even though I really wanted some pain medicine because I hurt so bad, um, I decided I needed to call my husband because I didn't want anybody to call him. I didn't want anybody to show up at my door, especially since again, you know, just he worked overnight at that time. So if somebody's banging on his door and then you see some uniform standing at his door. He's going to think the worst. Right. right. Yeah. All and of us would. Yeah. so, yep. He, he heard my voice and he even, he told me, he tells me all the time, I'm so glad you were the one that called me. And, um, I did, you know, it's just weird when the phone is ringing and you're like, what am I going to say? <laughs> like, how do I make this not sound ridiculous? Right. Yeah. And I just woke him up and I said, I need you to listen to me. I need you to wake all the way up because I have something to tell you. And I said, I'm okay, but I need you to hurry up and get to such and such hospital. I was shot three times, but I'm okay. And 
it was silence. I said, did you hear me? And he's like, uh, yeah, I think. So I repeated myself. And then I said, I got to go because I really need some pain meds. But this is what happened. This is where I'm going to be. So now he goes in the caveman mode, which I call it because he's like, somebody hurt my woman. I want to hurt them. But I also got to go get my kids from school. Right. So he does all that. Take the kids to a friend's house who normally watch them that day anyway. And he drives like a bat out of hell to the hospital. I also called my brother from the ambulance. And um, then my brother told my mom and, you know, now we're at the hospital. And I stayed in the hospital for three days. Mm -hmm. um, I had to have some hardware put in my right arm. Of course. They just slapped Band-Aids on the through and through um, injuries. And then, you know, I had some pain, some muscle relaxers and stuff like that and ice for my back. Yeah. And, um, it was just a surreal experience in the hospital. Cause it was like nonstop visitors, um, either that or I was on pain meds. So I don't remember part of it. And I was just really taken aback and overwhelmed by the amount of people that came to the hospital to see me rather they worked for my department or not, or rather they knew me or not. There were surrounding agencies that showed up at the hospital. I've never met them before. Like yeah. it was, it was absolutely amazing. A guy I used to work with at Gwinnett County who was living in Arizona at the time, just, and he was in Tucson, Arizona, which is South of me. He just happened to be in Phoenix doing a DRE training when my shooting happened. And I thought the pain meds were so good. I was hallucinating that he was standing in my doorway. <laughs> <laughs> did you come all the way up from Georgia? Where, where did you like, come from? I thought I was having a problem. Like I was about to call the nurse and then he smiles and he says, you know, you could have just asked me to come see you. You didn't have to get shot for me to come see you. And, you know, and so it's, it's, it's interesting. And then, you know, people want to see you, they want to make sure you're okay. But then, you know, me and my husband, we still have little kids we have to deal with. Right. You know, and I think that was probably one of the hardest things we had to deal with afterwards is explaining to a four-year-old what happened, even though, we skirted the truth in the beginning. Well, yeah, I mean, which yeah. I find there's, yeah. A, there's only so much they're so, going to understand. I mean, re realistic. I mean, it's not like a like my son's ten. It ain't like you're telling a ten year old versus a four year old. Like, right. there's a lot of separation and comprehension, realistically. Well, what I've learned is throughout all this is when it comes to our kids, we often underestimate their intelligence and how they feel. Like, there we block a lot of our feeling you know, and our energy going back and forth. Kids don't have that. They feel that. They feel it constantly. Right. And so um, my my 22 month old, all she cared about is being breastfed. That's all she cared about. Like she walked right in the hospital room and looked at me and said, boob, that's all she wanted. That's what we call her the boob monster. That's all she talked about. And she doesn't understand why I can't. She's just like, you haven't been home for like 36 hours at this point. I need that. Yeah. <laughs> my son, on the other hand, we told him I broke my arm at the time, which is an untrue, but he thought the hospital was a vampire hospital because he saw blood in the tube that they, that was on the wound vac that was attached to my arm. And he was like, this is a vampire hospital. They're stealing people's blood here, you know? And so he's a four-year-old, but when we got home, when I got home a few days later, I was changing out my bandages. He saw the holes in my arm. And he asked me straight up, are you sure the bad guy didn't just shoot you? He's four. What? So I wasn't prepared for that. Um, fast forward, I talked to my therapist. We did sit down and talk to him about it. I told my son straight up what happened. I just was very, I was, I just basically told him, I did not tell you the truth. I did get shot. He looked at all the places I got shot. And his first question to me was, well, why did you lie to me? So yeah. we, we have to be careful Correct. when we're balance. keeping things from our kids, but we can still give them just enough information. But the thing is, to your point about your, a 10 year old versus a four year old, their cognitive understanding changes very quickly at that age. Correct. So how he takes in the world and understands danger has changed. And I've gotten more questions over time. He's nine now. Oh, and I've yeah, gotten absolutely. more detailed questions, absolutely. you know, and so. I think we, we don't ever need to underestimate our kids. Um, I am very lucky for my support system. I had people that recognize certain anxiety and worry behaviors in my son that I didn't recognize. And my department was great. I had great peer support. You know, um, even when I was going through my um, medical retirement uh, 
process. I don't have the, okay, you're injured, you're no good to us story that some people have from their departments. My department treated me very well, even still to this day. There's a I'm lot, the there's a lot of those team. stories, unfortunately. I mean, and that's the downside. Uh, oh, yeah. That's why I've been so excited to hear yours right now. And it says it's not because you got shot. I don't want to hear that part. Yeah, like, right. Like the, the, the aftermath, like I had one guest yeah. on that said that um, she said her chief and deputy chief just dropped the business card to let her know because she was out when 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 it happened like mm -hmm. she was like sleep or something like that they stopped by she was sleep they dropped the business card and left they didn't even come back yeah. and wait so just hearing your story like i like i'm excited and see i like, had the opposite like, correct correct so now i'm, I'm happy to hear that opposite yeah because mm -hmm. that's and that's and it's good for people to hear both sides yeah my and, and and you're right and i used to shy away from it and my ch uh, chief uh, uh sylvia moyer was my chief at the time she was there with me in the triage room you know, she was there with me, you know, once my family got there, she came by the house later. Like, you know, this was an ongoing thing. So I never had that. I'm still in the peer support team at Tempe. I still have great support. And, you know, I like sharing that. And I just want to give back the same type of support and care that I was given. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times prior to our critical incident or that cumulative stress situation that just kind of breaks us, we're already dealing with life. It can be personal, it can be, it can be professional, but we're already dealing with life. Now you've compounded it with a critical incident. So we have to be very careful and very cognizant of that portion as well. And you know, if there's anything I can encourage people to do is don't be afraid to be a human being in a uniform. You know, just like what you were saying at the very beginning. Um, I, I tell people we are humans who wear uniforms. We're not our uniforms. Uniforms get dirty uniforms you can send to the cleaners you can put in the washer and they come out pretty much brand new but when trauma trauma weakens us over time and we can we can do things we can do things to help us out wellness wise but a lot of times we're not as strong as we were before um, and we have to be very careful because it won't take much for us to break the next time if we don't have proper things in place like being open enough to go seek mental health help um, and remembering that the same issues we're dealing with out on the street, we have within the walls of our organizations, whether it's addiction, infidelity, DV, money problems, like all this stuff, we have that stuff within our pub public safety population. And holding stuff in, it doesn't get you any medals. It gets you divorced. It gives you gut problems. It gives you insomnia. You know, it gives you anxiety. It gives you all this stuff that's not necessary. Like when we hold things in, it, it does things to you physically. So no different than when you take your car to get service. You want to make sure all the lines are flushed and everything's running smoothly because if something gets gunked up, that can affect other parts of your vehicle. We're the same way. If your body and mind aren't in tuned, you're going to have some problems. And I'm speaking from experience. I'm not yeah. saying this because I've never dealt with anything. I've definitely drank way too much just to not deal with stuff at work. Uh, made some not so great relationship decisions sometimes. Um, bought way more things than I need because of the instant gratification. It makes us feel good. So we have to be cognizant of those things. And when we're going out on calls, if you're telling people to do certain things with their lives and you're telling people to use certain resources, you damn better make sure you're doing those same things. Otherwise, you're a hypocrite. And I've oh, been that person. Yeah. And and now it's kind of cool, not that you retired from law enforcement. Obviously, your career ended much earlier than you wanted to because I'm sure you expected it not to be I, – I, I'm sure you expected to be at Tempe 20 to 25 years versus 10. Um mm -hmm. How has this incident, as you've grown and matured, because we all, I mean, everybody matures over time, not saying you weren't mm -hmm. mature before, but since right. you have been able to share your story now, how has that impacted your personal life? You know, I, so I, I've had some struggles first. Um, I, even though, you know, people, you know, I've, I'll have people reach out to me after I do a podcast interview or even after I, you know, I have a, a, a speaking engagement and I, I want to remind people what you see isn't how I always am, right? I've been better mentally this year, but I, I have ups and downs still. Although I was in a good place before my critical incident, um, I still see my therapist. You know, I do deal yeah. with some anxiety still. I still deal with some depression from time to time. 
And um, I don't like the triggers that come along with my critical incident. Um, they're like, I don't like the darkness anymore because the house was dark. Fireworks aren't really my thing anymore. And I love fireworks. I have to know that they're coming before they happen. You can't just yeah. pop a firework off next to me. Popping balloons at kids' birthday parties, you know? But at the same time, because I've learned much better coping skills, I can do things to kind of ride the wave of a, the, a panic attack and know that I'm going to be okay on the other side of it. So I think a lot of what I've learned too is I know a lot of us are type A personalities, but guess what? We don't control anything <laughs> because the the more we try to control certain things, even when our feelings are becoming a little bit out of control, you, you're going to find that the way we try to control it, we're just trying to ignore it. We're not even really controlling it. We're trying to pack it away somewhere and it will overflow at some point when you least expect it. You can knock over your cup of coffee and like memories that you didn't even know you still had can come to the forefront of your brain. Um, as far as me and my husband go, like, I think our, we're a lot more in tuned because of the panic attacks and things like that, that I've had. I'm, I will readily admit to him when I'm not feeling good, you know, when I'm feeling a little overwhelmed and it's really is a blessing because we get to speak together now. He comes from the non law enforcement aspect, the husband, right. you know, aspect. And so we get to travel together. Now we get to speak together and we get time away, you know, from our normal life of being mom and dad sometimes right. just, you know, to go speak, but also go be us, go explore a new city, have dinner or go see the sights in a new city and just be us for a minute. So it's definitely opened up a whole new world to me that I didn't even know existed because I think when we're working, a lot of us are just, we have the blinders on in our little blue world yes, or tan or green or which, whichever uniform you wear, but overall in our world and we never peek our heads out and be like, oh, wow, that I didn't even realize, I didn't even realize that was going on. And I, I asked a woman at a, a speaking engagement one time, I said, I'm curious if all these opportunities that are coming my way, if they were here before and I just couldn't see them. And now that this trauma has happened, because what trauma does, trauma does it makes an instant change within you. You don't have time to ease into the change. It's like being a parent. You know, one day I was pregnant, next day they're telling me I'm responsible for keeping a whole human alive and make sure they become a good citizen. I was like, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> and, you know, and so, um, you and I, we're getting to know each other now. I can walk away from this interview and decide if I like you, right? But when we have that that instant change in ourselves, we can't separate from ourselves. We have to slowly get used to this new person. And sometimes you don't like that person. Sometimes I don't like the new Lindsay, but guess what? I'm stuck with her. And I have to, we, I have to learn to live with the new Lindsay because we often wanna go back to before such and such happened. But I, I hate to tell you, there is no before. There's just now. And we 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 have to work with what we have now and um and try to ease into it. And it just it takes time and it takes practice and it takes support, you know. And I just I just want for other people, like I, I said before, what I had. You know, I've had really great support. I've had awesome connections with people. If you had asked me before my shooting if this is something I would be doing, I'm like, no, there's no way. You know, I, I should still be working right now. I didn't expect to be medically retired at 39. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just, that's just not what I expected. But, you know, I get to be with my kids. I'm home with my kids. Um, I get to take them to school. I get to take them to extracurricular. I get to volunteer. Me and my husband spend time in different ways. Me and my family and friends that are here in Arizona. So I'm very grateful for that. And I'm grateful that I still get to be connected to public safety the way I am and connect people with resources that they may need, whether it's a conversation or if they need to go to an inpatient facility you know, or whatever you may need in, bet in between. So sometimes we don't know what life has for us, but when that, when your plan changes, you know, as Paul Butler says, you definitely have to fall back on your purpose. And my purpose on this earth is to help people. Yeah. And you're just doing it from a different way now. That's it. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not like you're changing your, your, your whole um, goal. It's just that now you're doing it on a different platform before back in 2018, right. uh, 
for the that prior to that uh, 17 years pr- within that time frame you're doing it in a uniform you were helping mm-hmm. people out now you're outside of a uniform helping people in a uniform so no yep. matter what you're still impacting you're still fulfilling your purpose and it's in a different way and i love that you mentioned that all the opportunities that you have now and mm-hmm. i didn't know it either before i started speaking how many situations or how many people want to hear my story now i'm not i don't have traumatic stories like you and trust me i don't want to be shot to have that story i tell people all the time <laughs> hey I, i've heard all my, my other friends other speakers i've talked to i was like you've been through some traumatic things you tell your story <laughs> and what you do michael does right. not want to replicate your story and anybody <laughs> listening well you don't want to replicate some of the stories that you guys hear however wow. i think the concept of cumulative stress we all have that it's just uh-huh. how you manage it how you live through it and now i'm happy that you're realistic on how it is letting people know that yeah you've done the therapy you have good peer support you got good family support but you still struggle which is realistic Mm -hmm. there's no magic pill like you just can't turn your brain off to what happened in 2018 you can't turn your brain off from the 2017 postpartum like those are all real things that you're still dealing with and for people that are listening you might be going through something tough right now but you still got to keep trying to work through it just because you mm-hmm. worked on it six months doesn't mean the next six months is going to be perfect. You're going to have to continue to work on it and find ways to grow within it. It might be sharing your story. It might be yeah. going and volunteer at the school, whatever it might be. It's not this It's never a time just to quit and say, you know what? Mm-hmm. This is too tough for me. Think of it as a different way to challenge it. And I think, Lindsay, you're doing an excellent job of that. Thank you. I I no, And I, I appreciate it. And I, yeah, I, I do miss the job. You know, people do ask me that sometimes. I miss being in uniform. I'm, I won't lie to you about it. Um, my son actually wore one of my old uniform shirts to the Shop with a Cop event that we recently um, volunteered at. And I'm looking at him. First of all, I can't even believe he's he's kind of fit in the shirt, which is stressing me out. I'm like, when did you get so big? But I'm looking at him walk around in my uniform shirt like, man, what I, you know, some days what I wouldn't give to put that uniform back on again and, you know, I'm I'm still in contact with my partner. She did return back to work um, about five months after uh, our shooting. And she's still out there doing her thing. I love checking in on her. And, you know, she's to me, she's a fantastic cop. Um, and she's a fantastic mom, fantastic friend. And I wish her the best out there. And I kind of live vicariously through her sometimes when I want to hear about her day and hear about stories. And some people just have a calling and she she's really good at what she does out on patrol. And um, there are some people that, I mean, they're made for patrol, just those yep. calls and making You're those right. connections. And I think that's definitely something I miss. Um, but to your point, I'm still helping people. I may not be in uniform anymore, but I get to help, you know, people who are still in uniform and not just them, their families too, you know, because I want to keep, I want to keep public safety families together. I don't want us having like 75% divorce rate. That's crazy. That's cra- I read a statistic once that said a, 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 a couple who experiences loss, like the loss of a child, their, you know, their marriage dissolving, that that rate is like 85%. They have an 85% chance of their marriage dissolving. And public safety divorce is like at 75%. Yeah, so it's right around the corner. You know, and, uh, you know, so I want to keep us together. I want us to have healthy retirements. I want us to have good, you know, make, not have any regrets about things that we've done or, um, you know, not have night sweats and, and nightmares about things that we've seen. I want us to have good relationships with our families, but that all starts with remembering that we are human beings and we have to offload. We're not designed to see the things that we see for, you know, a 20, 30, 35 year career. And you just hold it all in and you don't ever tell anybody about it. It, it's going to come out. It's going to come out in ways you don't want it to. And it's going to come out when you least expect it. You know, we're as, as type A as we are, our brain is still a mystery to people that are way more intelligent than I'll ever hope to be. And our brain protects ourselves from trauma, but it'll also release that trauma without sending you a memo saying, hey, I'm showing up today. It doesn't do yeah. that. Yeah. You know, it, so it, it, at least when you least you know, expect it. 
Yeah. You know, please take care of your brain. Please take care of your body. And if things aren't working for you at your agency, as far as like how they provide help to you after stress or after a critical incident, please say something. You know, don't just sit there and talk about how they don't care about us. Maybe they don't know it's a problem because everybody's situation is unique to them. Absolutely. And it just could be a blind spot in the care. Let them know that it's a problem so that they can implement that into their program. You know, because you can find yourself in another critical incident or high stress situation or your partner next to you. And then you didn't take the time to say anything and nothing has changed. We're not helping anybody by doing that. So, I, you know, I always encourage people, encourage people, be your own best advocate. You know, my grandfather, um, my, my late grandfather used to always say a closed mouth don't get fed. So if you don't say something, how is somebody supposed to know something is wrong? Agencies yeah. have too many personalities for the head of your agency to just assume they know what's going on. Rather, it's 25 employees or it is 1,500 employees. You have to bring it to their attention and make them change it at the end of the day. Yeah. And, and you know what? It's just like our, my development as a business owner. I do things on my own. Like if you mm -hmm. don't feel like your agency is doing enough, don't wait for them to finally do that something part. right. Go, yes. go get it yourself because- I've yes. learned with my own growth, my own therapy. I mean, I do, I do therapy. I pay for it out of my pocket. I'm not waiting for mm -hmm. people to help, help make me better. So once again, even that's if not you their find, job, you know, that's what I'm saying. Like if you find your, the agency not doing that one, bring it up. Say, Hey guys, y'all might want to do this, but while you're waiting for them to get better, get, make yourself better, go out there and get mm -hmm. the help you need that you need yep. for yourself. There's plenty of resources. There's plenty there of resources. I mean, there's so many organizations now that help, uh, military and public public safety employees when it comes to mental health. So, the, you know, not being able to find a therapist or an inpatient facility or some of the other um, more holistic resources that we have access to now, trust me, they're out there. You just have to find the right person to connect you with it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, it's important guys. I mean, part of your own self-awareness, your own self-growth is, is working on yourself. Like mm -hmm. if you wait for people to do it, Trust me, especially if you wait for any organization, whether it's law enforcement or not, you got to remember, although the organization says that you are their priority at the end results is their priority. Mm -hmm. So there however, go. they, and they're going to prioritize what gets the results. If getting five more patrol vehicles is the priority versus creating <laughs> a peer support unit, they're going to get those five patrol vehicles. I mean, you just got to. Oh, you, my goodness. You know what I mean? But it's real. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. I, I, it's funny you said that because what I, I say something very similar to that in that when I'm talking to agencies, when I'm talking to leaders, I tell them, remember, sometimes we care more about the equipment than they do that we do the person that's operating it. If, if a, a patrol vehicle is up for its preventative maintenance, rather mileage or date, and it's not to the shop, guess what? You're going to get an email, right? From the shop then your sergeant, then somebody else. Oh. And so you'll get constant reminders. But why don't we have those same email reminders for an employee to go get mental health help after a crazy call or after multiple crazy calls in a short amount of time? Right. Do we constantly remind them, hey, you know, this resource is out there. So basically you tell me you care more about the oil being changed in a patrol car than the officer that's operating it and driving it to crazy call to crazy call every single day. I said, that's not okay. Yeah. You care more about the radios being updated than the person who has to use that radio. And yes, we need it updated so we can communicate effectively. But sometimes it's okay to bring somebody off the street for a minute and say, hey, pop your vest, get some water. Let's Let's decompress for a minute. There's nothing wrong with that. So I, that's why I love that you said that about the car just now, because I mean, I, I feel that so much. And that's one of the things I harp on is like equipment person. I'm going to go with the person. <laughs> yeah, but but it, it takes it. But it's sometimes it takes those that um, realization through things like therapy to understand where, where we need to truly value ourselves. And still in law enforcement, one of the things that we are up on that uphill battle is recognizing what you need internally not just externally. And I believe as generations evolve, as we hit the, the newer um, workforces coming in, mm -hmm. we're going to see a stronger focus on people versus the mm -hmm. equipment. Because I mean, honestly, that's, I mean, like when I started, we started around the same time. Um, equipment, things like that was important. Like 
mental yeah. wellness, self awareness. It, it wasn't that it was completely missing. It just wasn't a priority. Versus now, where it seems, yeah. especially since we speak so much, it seems like it's starting to be more focused on because the studies are starting mm-hmm. to become so prevalent that it's becoming alarming. So they're like, hey, if you're not, it's almost like <laughs> if you're not working on your mental health um, in your agency, what's wrong with you? So now chiefs, sheriffs, directors, wardens, whatever the CEO title is, they're being mm-hmm. rated on things like that on top of everything else. So now you see more of that shift being yeah. increased to improve that that inner person. And it should it should be like that though. You know, I I believe wellness that's that's like from from beginning to the end. As far as I'm concerned, your peer support should be involved from the time somebody gets you recruiting somebody all the way until retirement and after. Because to me, peer support goes with everything. Rather it's a promotion, rather it is going from a, to another unit or a critical incident or even personal stuff. To me, it's all hand in hand. You know, and I, there is more of a focus. And as far as uh, leaders go, you know, my my thing to leaders is you you can't effectively push resources for wellness if you're not telling your story and if you're not utilizing those resources as well. Because then your people, like children, children mimic what they see at home, 100%. right? 100%. So if if you don't ever show emotion or you show explosive emotion, your kids will begin to do the same thing. Well, as a leader of an agency, if you're not telling your troops about the divorce that almost happened because of a special unit you were in, or um, you know the long hours or getting in trouble back in your early years and how that almost derailed your whole career or your divorce or multiple divorces, if you're not having those conversations with your people, those same things are happening with them. They're going to think that you're perfect and never nothing has ever gone on in your life. And I said, that's, that's not, that doesn't work because you're not being true to your people. I'm not saying you have to get all in the weeds about your personal business, but they need to feel like you all can vibe but that you guys are similar. Not that, you know, you're the chief or the deputy director, or director or whatever, and you're untouchable. You don't seem real to people. You don't seem attainable to people. And I do understand that the higher up you go, the less people you have to talk to, less people you have to confide in. I understand that. But if you're going to be out there pushing resources that we have now, wellness programs and yoga and all this other stuff, your people need to hear your story. When we have wellness trainings, chiefs, sheriffs, wardens, you need to have your behinds in those seats because your people don't feel you mean it if they don't see you in the room. That's probably one of the most things I hear when I go to wellness conferences. Where's the brass? How come command isn't here? <laughs> I, I hear that so much. And, yeah. you know, I, I understand they're busy with meetings, and but you, you, you will make time for what's important. Your agency is, if your agency is important, you need to be in that room. Not to spy, but to be amongst the crowd and really hear what people are going through and what they need from their agency to be well-rounded, healthy employees. People are your greatest resources. I mean, that's that's yep. what it boils down to. And I mean, even sitting in the class, I mean, you're fortunately nobody's perfect. So even that that right. that CEO level command staff for the brass, they're learning too. Because mm-hmm. trust me. I, Coming up, I didn't take psychology. Coming up, I didn't take right. things that require me to study mental health. So more than mm-hmm. likely, that CEO of whatever organization that they're in, they haven't experienced much of that either. So they're a student as much as that rookie officer is right now. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, but yeah, again, I just, I, I just want us to be happy and healthy. And, you know, if there's anything I can do to help, rather sharing my story, Mm -hmm. doing interviews like this, you know, obviously meeting people like you and some of the other people that are kind of in our sphere, you know, I I want to be able to do as much as that as I can. And, you know, even if somebody just, you know, needs a, hey, I just, I just need an ear to vent, you know, I'm, I'm here to do that for people. So good. So that transitions perfectly to my next question. So Lindsay, if somebody's looking to find you, reach you, book you, just contact you for anything, what are some of the best ways they can do that? Um, well, you can go to my website. It's uh, Lindsay Talks. So just my first name and the word talks.com. And I'm also on LinkedIn. 
under Lindsay McCall Long. And uh, my email address is lindsay at lindsaytalks.com. And it's Lindsay with an A. Do not spell my name with an E. We might have to fight. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I'm always open, you know, for conversation. If you need resources, um, the opportunity to speak somewhere, um, you know, that those are the ways that, that you can reach me for sure. I love connecting. I love networking with people. And just, you know, I love learning about the other mental health resources that are available to first responders and public safety as well. Perfect. So folks, if you're looking for Lindsay, you got her website, you got her LinkedIn, you got her email, and I'll put all in the show notes for you guys, but reach out. I mean, you hear what she's available for. She's everything you're, we're looking for, everything we promote on the show, everything you heard me talk about in the past, whether it's in person or the podcast, this is what we want. We, we want people that have experienced things in law enforcement and that are willing to share it because that in itself can be therapeutic, but it's also helpful to see that people struggle and they're still able to get through the different struggles they're going through. So Lindsay, final words. You know, just something I've already said, please be your own best advocate. You know, you may know, you may not know what you need, but you know, it's not working. And if the people around you, be it at home or even within your agency, or if they're doing things or pushing things that just aren't working for you, please take the time to, to tell them that. Because by not saying anything, it's only going to hurt you in the end, you know? And remember, I love superheroes and I know a lot of us love superheroes, but superheroes have tragic origin stories and some of us do too. And we carry that into our jobs and superheroes are vulnerable to weaknesses just like we are, okay? And, you know, I know we want to right all the wrongs of the world. We can do that, but we have to be stable and we have to be 100% before we can go out and protect others and do a good job of it. So, you know, let's remember we're here to be a community. We are human beings. Remember you're a human before you're anything else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if there's something you need, you shouldn't be afraid to turn to somebody and say, hey, I'm struggling today. Can you help me? Yeah. And those are powerful words. And to kind of add to that, I'm talking about the superhero thing, my son and I just had a conversation about what's better, Marvel or DC. And as you were saying that, I was thinking about the Superman story. I mean, if you really look, if you look at his story, his parents shipped him as the planet was blowing up to, to the <laughs> right. He was literally raised by adopted parents. Yeah. So obviously from an early age on, he he like he faced trauma. trauma. But but you're right, though, but you're right. Every every story. It, a lot of stories have trauma in it and trust. I, I don't know anybody that got shit from another planet right now. So like I said, everybody's story <laughs> different, but it's right. realistic to think about. So folks, you have heard, um, Lindsay, you've heard what she does. Think about where you're at in your life right now. Where, what are you doing to improve yourself? If you're waiting for someone else to do it, you're going to continue to wait for someone else to do it. You need to go out there and get that help you need. I'm not saying you need to go to a therapist, a counselor, but just get something. Go vent to somebody. Go find someone that's neutral. You got two people on this show. That's I know my door is always open. Now you know Lindsay's door is always open. Yes. But yes. If you find yourself struggling, go get help. If you're finding looking for mentorship, if you're looking for motivation, whatever it might be, there's somebody out there for you. You need to find the time right now to kind of grow yourself in that area. And any obstacle that you went through, any failures, anything. It, you could push past it. If you're, if you're listening to uh -huh. this, obviously you've made it to some point in your life to where you're, you're not dead, which is good. So if you're alive, you can keep kicking. I know sometimes we use that word and people are like, Oh, I don't want to talk about death or being dead. You're going to do it anyways. It's going to happen. So while you're uh -huh. still here, live it, enjoy it, yes. maximize yes. it because that's the way you're going to succeed. And that's the way you're going to be best for your kids, your spouse, even your agency. Cause if you're not whole, if you're not focused on building that on top of everything else, you're going to find yourself struggling. And when you hit that critical, critical incident, whether you're in this industry or not, because you could easily be in a car crash, not related to anything. And that, that that's mm -hmm. a, that's a critical incident. That's going to be stressful. You get 10 pins in your knee or something like that. I don't have any pins in my knee, but I'm just like thinking <laughs> about different things, but you can, you can be in something stressful. What are you doing to have prepared yourself for that? And that's part of it. So Thank you all for listening. We appreciate your time. We definitely appreciate all the comments that we get. And I appreciate Lindsay reaching out and coming on the show and sharing her story and definitely giving you guys a lot of good nuggets to kind of take back to wherever you're going. So once again, guys, 
Um, if you have any questions, reach out to her, reach out to me, but we enjoyed our time. We enjoyed having you on there. If you have anything else, reach out. If not, be safe and have a great day. You've been listening to the LEO First Podcast. Michael has been in law enforcement since 2005. He's worked for three law enforcement agencies in three different states. He's a professional speaker who travels the country teaching about leadership development and self-awareness. And he's the author of a book called Greatness Beyond the Badge, The Three Key Principles for Self-Awareness. It's Michael's passion to bring law enforcement members' stories to the front so you get the real and raw take. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hook up with Michael on YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Michael Laidler. On Twitter at Michael A. Laidler. On Facebook at Michael Laidler Leadership. Send an email to Michael at MichaelALaidler.com. And hit the website at MichaelALaidler.com. See you next time on the LEO First Podcast.